All right, for those of you not totally familiar with the, uh, with the car and the channel, uh, this is our 2020 Mustang GT, uh, affectionately, affectionately uh, known as Dad Bod. Um, it is a full weight, full interior, my son's uh, baby seat in the back, uh, 2020 Mustang GT uh, with a twin turbo, 10 R80, um, and a whole lot of horsepower. So the goal in this car, and the reason why this is kind of such a, uh, such a big deal is um, anybody goes fast, you know, when you take weight out of the car, right? Anybody goes fast, you know, super lightweight in a Fox body, etc. cetera. But, um, my goal and our goal with this car when I bought it uh, a little while ago, a year, year or two ago, um, was to, first of all, make an eight second daily driver. Um, daily driver meaning full exhaust, air filters, uh, full interior, you know, everything, right? Nothing's taken out of the car, nothing is removed. Um, if anything, stuff is added, right? Uh, turbo kit, uh, suspension, etc. cetera. Um, the only weight weight reduction on the car, if you want to call it that, would be the drag pack. But other than that, there's nothing. Um, it's got, you know, AC, interior, back seat, everything. Um, my son's baby seat in the back, uh, we drive it everywhere. Um, and that was kind of the point, right? So how this whole journey started was we put our built motor in and, all right, so as I'm talking, Nick walks over. Uh, <laughs> Nick so gracefully <laughs> has, uh, has let me steal his high pressure pump for testing uh, because one of the other things we figured out in this whole deal was I uh, somehow we smoked the high pressure fuel pump. Um, and so I had one coming, but in the meantime, for diagnostic purposes, <laughs> we've uh, take a pump on, put a pump off, take a puff, take a pump off, put a pump on. So we have played um, musical pumps with, uh, with Nick's high pressure pump. And so it's the end of the day, uh, we're ready to go home. And so Nick is going to uh, take his pump. <laughs> take his pump off the car and uh, put it back in his car. So anyway, the idea of the car initially was to be eight second daily driver, stock motor, um, drive to the car, run eights, drive back. And we did, uh, we went 850 and 163 stock motor, uh, built trans of course, cause you know, 10 R's don't really do well uh, with big boy power. Uh, and so we did that, uh, I forget when, a while ago, um, last year sometime. So the new goal was to go uh, be a seven second daily driver. Um, seven second, you know, drive the track, run a couple sevens and drive it home. So that was the goal, right? And so in trying to make the power required uh, to do that uh, was when we discovered this issue. Um, and so that's kind of the backstory. Uh, that is the uh, reason why this mess is uh, what it is. So anyway, now on to the video. All right. Ready? Yep. All right. This has been a rough three weeks. Uh, we have been trying to diagnose the misfire in this car unsuccessfully for three weeks, uh, maybe longer. I'll have to check the, check the uh, calendar. We have went as far as to put the original stock motor back in. The big boy motor is over there. The sleeved in engine is over there. Um, we've swapped engines. We have swapped harnesses, we have swapped uh, PCMs, every sensor, we've done everything. Uh, the symptoms of the car were pretty uh, minimal. On the dyno, you know, looking to make 1700 horsepower, uh, we got up to 1654 uh, and I heard a little misfire on the dyno. Uh, when I run the dyno, I wear uh, earmuffs, uh, which keeps sound out, which also lets me hear um, a little, little better what the engine is doing. Uh, so things that you might not hear with the naked ear, uh, with the earmuffs on, you can actually hear, especially stuff like pinging and misfires um, that sometimes can be hard to hear when you have uh, a super loud car. In the case of this car making, you know, 1600 plus horsepower with dumps and no exhaust and, and twin turbo deals. So it's pretty loud. Um, so I heard the misfire. Um, I asked my guys, hey, did you hear a misfire? Nope, didn't hear anything. I was like, I heard a misfire. So first thing we want to do is check the plugs. Um, and that is where the absolute rabbit hole of doom began. So what started out as a simple misfire, uh, rapidly or not so rapidly, but uh, consistently deteriorated to the car won't even run at idle. Misfiring just nonstop. Um, 
because the stock PCMs are pretty sensitive uh, to misfire uh, actions, uh, it's not uncommon to turn that logic and that protocol off in the tune, especially when you've got a car, twin turbo, you know, making you know, a lot of power with uh, a colder plug, a super tight plug gap. Um, it's gonna misfire on cold start, and so it, it becomes more of a nuisance to actually have the car tell you it's misfiring versus just hearing and, and knowing that it's misfiring, right? So the log, of course, said no misfires. So I turned that back off, or turned that logic back on. Lo and behold, we got misfires. Um, I can hear them, I can see them in the log, and we have been going non, well not non-stop, we have been going unsuccessfully for three weeks, almost non-stop, trying to figure out what the cause is. Um, you name it, we've done it. Uh, swap valve springs, we swap PCMs, engine harnesses, every sensor on the dang car, um, everything. We went so far as to put, um, put stock plugs in, open the gap back up, uh, put 93 back in the tank. Um, we've pulled the valve covers off, checked the valves, or checked the, the cams, checked the, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, every time we think we got it figured out, we're wrong. And we, th we, we finally got it figured out, uh, pretty sure. Uh, we've been looking for a smoking gun since day one. Uh, and every time we think we have a smoking gun that we're gonna discover, once we figure out, oh, it's gotta be this, we investigate, we, we take off said part, and it looks perfect. Uh, example, the cams. You know, the biggest thing, especially if you watched uh, Cooper's uh, podcast, I thought for sure the cam lobe spun. Uh, it, it fit all the symptoms, uh, the misfire, the fact that the car has no crank uh, codes, no cam codes, no, no timing codes at all, right? So we thought maybe the VCT phasers went out or maybe something happened, but normal, normally when that happens, you get a check engine light on the car to say, hey, bank one, you know, sensor one or bank one intake cam or whatever is unhappy, it pretty much tells you, right? It makes it almost idiot proof. Uh, um, there are no codes. Uh, as far as the PCM is concerned, the cam, uh, all four cams and the crank are perfectly in time. There's no issues. But with the misfires that we had and the fact that it misfired substantially more on port injection versus when the DI was on, uh, that made sense, right? We thought, okay, the port is going to be spraying on a closed valve, right? But if the cam lobes have turned and now the intake valve is no longer closed when the PCM thinks it is, it's going to inject fuel on what it thinks is a closed valve, but instead it's going to be an open valve. You spray, you know, air fuel into an open chamber that's not expecting it, it's going to misfire. Versus the DI system can only inject in a very narrow window, right? Compression stroke for, you know, a very, very short amount of degrees of rotation. So it misfired a little on DI, but not nearly as bad. So that made sense, right? If the cam lobes have turned, even one or two cam lobes have turned, that would exactly fit our symptoms. Misfire, more pronounced under port injection, uh, port injection, less pronounced under direct injection, but still a thing. Um, pull the valve covers off, cams look perfect. Uh, there are some weird marks uh, on, a, on one of the cams, or on both intake cams, there were some weird wear patterns. Not on the lobes themselves, but on the actual casting. Uh, we thought, you know, who knows, maybe the cams turned and twisted or flexed, or whatever. But to eliminate that, we pulled the whole motor out. So we put a known good motor in. You know, I, you know, I would have bet money that the cam lobes had turned, or maybe they, maybe because we didn't see they turned, maybe two lobes turned the same amount of clicks, so they, so they appear fine, but they're really not fine. <laughs> we pulled, pulled the motor out pull the turbo kit off, put a stock motor back in, stock headers, stock cats. It's, you know, we kept the intake manifold, the GT350 intake manifold, because all the vacuum lines are set up that way, but put a stock cold air intake on there, put the tune back to stock, fire it up, exact same issue. Nothing, nothing changed. Uh, but that did help tremendously because now I made a list of what we carried over from stock motor to built motor. So, logically speaking, if the issue wasn't a thing before, the bug is driving me freaking nuts. If it wasn't a thing before, get out of here, bug. If, if it wasn't misfiring before on stock motor, put the built motor in, it's not misfiring, all of a sudden it develops a misfire. Well, if you pull that motor back out, put the stock motor back in, and it still misfires, whatever carried over from the built motor to the stock motor going back in has to be the cause. What, what, what do we carry over? Oh. For that, we think it's an injection problem. We pull out the ID 2000s, put 
put in stock, uh, we put in GT500 injectors, didn't fix the issue. I was like, well, who knows? Maybe these are junk out of the box. We put in stock, factory stock uh, injectors that this car came with, still the same issue. Um, so nothing was helping. Uh, but we also learned when the DI system would come on, the, port, the pressure in the tank would plummet. It would drop to like 20, 22 PSI. So we thought for sure it had a fueling issue. Um, put the stock motor in, same issue. So now we've, we've narrowed it down to about eight, eight different things. Only eight different components were carried over. Uh, high pressure DI pump, the DI lines, the hard lines were carried over. Um, what else did we reuse? The fuel, the fuel tank, obviously the gas tank, the, the chassis itself, uh, the fuel hat, uh, the, all the fuel lines carried over, the fuel rails carried over, uh, intake manifold, um, coils. Uh, it's got brand new plugs with a brand new gap, so they weren't carried over. Um, what else, Josh? What else we carry over? Known good coils. Okay. Yeah, we put known good coils. DI pump. Yeah, high pressure pump, high pressure lines, uh, intake manifold. Uh, back on 93 octane, it was a 93 on the stock motor, or excuse me, the, the sleeve motor is still misfiring. Um, so there's only a few things it could have been. Uh, so we, th I thought, oh man, the friggin' the fuel pressure is plummeting when the DI pump comes on. Maybe the, maybe the high pressure pump went bad. So we pull that out. Uh, we borrow Nick's uh, pressure, uh, high pressure pump from his car. It seemingly is better pressure, but it's still misfiring. It didn't change the issue. So um, it's not a, not, a, not a high pressure pump issue, but. The, the, the thing about going back to the stock motor and going back to stock injectors, a stock intake, right? I can load without a doubt the correct calibration, right? Not that my calibrations are wrong, but with factory fuel pressure, factory injectors, a factory intake manifold, I don't have to guess and make sure the tune is right, make sure it's not a tune thing. I can take that data from Ford, put it in the PCM. With all that stuff being correct, the fuel trim should be dead on the money. You know, it's a little chillier today. I mean, chilly, it's like 70 degrees. Um, the fuel trim should be no more than two to 5% off of target, right? So I'm seeing 30 to 40% uh, positive trims on when the port's on. And it's like, there's no way that should be. It just, it, knowing how the computer works, how the PCM, you know, calculates that, it can't be, right? The only way that would be a thing is if A, there's an intake leak, but as far as I've ever seen, doing this a long time, I have never seen an intake leak cause a misfire. It might cause, you know, some bank. All right, sorry, the phone rang. Uh, perks of doing this, with, doing this with your cell phone versus an actual GoPro or a dedicated camera. So I'm holding these for a reason. We're, we're going to get there. So there's only a few things that can cause, you know, a, a, a fuel trim to go noticeably high. A, if, if the storage of the fuel is wrong, right? If you put E85 in the tank uh, and the car is expecting 93 octane, um, it's gonna run super lean, right? The car is only gonna be spraying a little bit of fuel for what it thinks is gasoline, but if you have ethanol in the tank that needs a lot more physical volume, you're gonna see way positive fuel trims, um, and that's gonna, that's gonna show up there. In this case, you know, that, that's a known, a known variable. Right? We put in 93 octane for 100% certainty. It's got a factory storage, 14.08, uh, so that can't be a thing. So if that's the case, the only other reason why you would see uh, a substantial positive uh, fuel trim, especially when it's a global, right? It's not just one bank or the other. The entire system is up 30 to 40 percent. The only way that happens is if, the, if, is if the, the PCM is seeing more air in the system than it's expecting, right? And so it's, it's having to compensate for oxygen or air by adding more fuel to the fuel trims, right? It's adding more inject injector. Well, that can't be, right? There's no intake leak, we check that, right? Uh, the only other thing it can be is like oxygenated fuel. Well, how in the world do you get, you know, did, did uh, Circle K all of a sudden get, you know, oxygenated gasoline? You know, are they trying to bump up, you know, power in these cars? No. That only leaves aerated fuel. Well, how in the world can the fuel be aerated? We know we've got five to six gallons in the tank. How can it be aerated? Well, it's fairly well known that you can't run a aftermarket triple pump system too low. Why? Because on a stock system, the fuel pump sits in a bucket, right? 
So this bucket is always full of fuel. So even if the tank gets low and the fuel sloshes around, it stays in the bucket, right? But on a floor renovation, on a triple pump system, there is no bucket, right? So you would think if this is in the tank, okay, and the socks are at the very bottom of the tank, you could run the tank, you know, reasonably low, right? You could run the tank down here before you start sucking in air through the fuel sock, right? The, the, the car already has provisions you know, with a saddle, uh, saddle fuel tank to transfer one to the other. So you would think as long as you've got, you know, above the, where the, the intake on the pump is, you'd be fine, but you'd be wrong. So in all of this testing, like, you know, guys who drag race, right? Nobody goes drag racing with a full 16 gallon fuel tank, right? Everybody goes with, you know, quarter tank, three eighths of a tank, right? You don't want all the extra weight. You know, what's a gallon, what's a gallon of fuel weigh? Like, I don't know, 10 pounds, eight pounds, whatever it is. Um, so you're talking 80 to 100 pounds of extra ballast in a car that you don't necessarily need. You're just carrying around dead weight. So it's not uncommon for, you know, someone to get the tank, you know, lower than low, you know, low and, and race and have no problem. So how could that be? How could, how could the fuel be, be being aerated? Well, we need to learn about what the Venturi effect is and how the stock system is designed to work. So in your tank, in your stock saddle tank, you have your fuel pump. Then on the other side, you have a second fuel level sender and you have what the crossover connects to. So I don't want to go into how Venturi effect works because I'm not a scientist, but when you create suction, you have an open port or when you have a pump that's, that's pumping, right? And it's, it's drawing fluid through, it's gonna create suction at this port here, um, which normally wouldn't be a problem. You have this fuel pump hat or whatever is, is on the passenger side, this is on the driver's side. And there's a line that connects these two together. And you see in the bottom here, there's a check valve. It only goes one way, right? So when the, when the pump is on, and you have fuel on this side, it's gonna pump the fuel from the passenger side tank over to the driver's side tank. Of course, we know that, that's, that's, that's fairly common knowledge, right? This float is gonna tell the PCM how much fuel is actually in the tank, right? Because if you have, an eight, have a 16 gallon tank, eight gallons on one side, eight gallons on the other, and you, and you drain the tank all the way out, right? Well, the tank has a, a crossover pipe, you know, the, the saddle part crosses over. So as you pour gas or as you pump gas in the driver's side, once it gets to about six or so gallons, it starts to spill over into the passenger tank. And so you've got driver's side tank and passenger tank. If this one's all, if, if they're both empty, right? Well, when you start to fill up the driver's side tank, once it gets to about six gallons, five, six gallons or so, it's gonna spill over to the passenger tank. So this side stops filling up, passenger side starts to fill up. Well now, once they get to the same level, they're gonna fill up together, right? They, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen on Facebook, there's always these like silly uh, quizzes or challenges like A, B, C, D, or E, which one fills up first? It's like that, right? If you've got bucket one and bucket two, but they're connected in the middle at say three quarters up the total, the total height, when you fill up bucket A, bucket B stays empty until you get to that level. It spills over, fills up this side, and then they both rise together. Conversely, when you, when you use the fuel on the driver's side tank, because that's where the fuel feed and the fuel return is located, it's gonna drain this side, right? Well, once, it, once the pumps are on, the Venturi effect is active, right? So this pump is always on, there's always suction here. This suction, goes to the passenger side down here, and this sits at the very bottom of the tank. This little foot here sits on the tank, you know? So it's gonna be creating suction and sucking the passenger side tank down as well. So once the driver's side tank goes down, far enough uh, past where the passenger tank is, it's gonna venturi effect, fill it back up. It keeps this at, you know, whatever level, and this side comes down, this side comes down, this side comes down, and they gradually come down together, bam, the tank is empty. On a stock configuration, that's not a big deal because if you only put, well, let me back up. Well, what if you only put a few gallons in? 
on stock, that's fine because it's going to go to the driver's side. This bucket's going to fill up. This bucket's always got fuel in it. So even if you if, even if you don't have enough to get over the threshold to fill up the passenger side tank, you're still going to have the driver's side tank full of fuel because the fuel uh, stays contained in the bucket. Once the bucket's empty, you're out of gas. This level, this fuel level center is going to be down. This one's going to be coming down. The PCM is going to tell you, hey, you're getting out. You're out of gas. So conceivably, you could drive your car, put a few gallons in at a time, empty it, put a few gallons in at a time, empty it, and it not be an issue. You can't do that on this setup, which, yeah, if you go on Ford's website, it, it just has, has a big bold print, you know, you must run the, you know, the level higher than normal. Why? Why? Why can't I, why can't I run it like a stock car? It's not because, it's not because, you know, the, the socks are down here, it's because a the crossover is up higher but b if you never if you drain the tank low so let me back up so in all this testing trying to figure out this stupid misfire we've been swapping fuels you know i got no i got ignite red from the track we put ignite red in the tank um but you know i'm not trying to put 15 gallons of you know 80 dollar pail fuel we put in like three or four gallons unbeknownst to me for however long well no that's not true. We, we pump the tank out. We pump the tank empty. So when we put three or four gallons, we never exceeded the threshold to spill over and have fuel go from the driver's side tank to the passenger tank, which is going to saturate this foot, which is going to effectively close off a wide open suction port to suck in air into the fuel. Subsequently aerating the fuel, subsequently causing a misfire, subsequently causing the fuel jumps to go crazy lean um, and cause three weeks of a lot of headache. So what does that mean? That means when you run this style system, which like I knew you could get the tank low, but the thing is I've got it low, right? I've raced a car at a quarter tank, at an eighth of a tank, you know, whatever it is, right? It wasn't a problem. Like this was never a problem until now. So why all of a sudden was it a problem? It was a problem because when I drained the tank, I never got past that threshold of five, six gallons for it to spill over. It doesn't take much, you know, a half a gallon or so extra to get above that threshold to come down here and saturate this foot to close off the system and no longer allow uh, the fuel pump to effectively aerate the fuel uh, itself. So, that's a long, how long is this video? It's the first part's 10 minutes. Oh, the second part's 10 minutes. 10, yeah, we got, we got a long way to go. But or we went a long way. But, bloopers. Well, you know. But, now that we had the whole picture, it all makes perfect sense. So why did the issue get incrementally worse over time? So first is a minor misfire, and then a little bit worse, a little worse. We do a pull, check a few things, do a pull, progressively worse and, worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Why would that be? Well, as I'm using the fuel in the tank, it's not able to, to refill this side and it's aerating worse and worse and worse and worse. Eventually it sucked that whole side dry and now there's nothing in there and now you've got a completely aerated fuel system. Um, when you think you've got a cam lobe issue, when you think you've got every other issue in the planet versus had I just put 10 gallons, you know, or really seven gallons of fuel in the tank, it would have fixed itself, right? Because it was spilled over, closed off the system, no more aeration, and we're good. So, huge lesson learned. Uh, we haven't confirmed that's the fix, uh, but I'm pretty confident uh, because, hey, there's only a few things left to check. So if this doesn't fix it, um, the car is haunted. Uh, we're gonna call a, a priest. Uh, we're gonna have a, what's that thing called? Exorcist. Exor exorcism done. Uh, get whatever demons out of this car out of the shop uh, and we're gonna get this this gone. But I'm so confident that this is gonna fix it that uh, we made this video. Um, we're also going to um, fire it up here in a minute and verify okay. it is in fact fixed. So in summary, you can technically run your tank low, right? You can go to the track, you can run it low. That's not a problem. As long as you have exceeded the threshold for the passenger side to stay saturated. 
once you come down, if you don't fill it back up with at least basically half a tank of fuel, the passenger side will never spill over and you're gonna have aerated fuel until you correct that, that fault in the system uh, that is self-inflicted. So uh, I'll wrap it up for now. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, if you like what you saw, more technical content, uh, subscribe, tell your friends, like, share, all that stuff. Uh, we're gonna fire this thing back up. We're gonna put this back in. We're gonna put the stock, or we're gonna put the, um, oh. I thought maybe the hat was bad. We put in a brand new hat just to make sure, and that's when kind of the light bulb moment came on that let's check this side and see. Uh, lo and behold, as you can tell, there's, I didn't dry this off, right? This, this has been bone dry for quite a while. Um, this is a, this is old, this is supposed to be dry, but this, this just came out of the car uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, and it's bone dry and it's been dry for a while. So <laughs> um, we're gonna get this thing back together and we'll see what happens. All right, stay tuned. Alrighty, so I just uh, just watched the uh, these two clips. Uh, and I had a few things to add. Uh, one, where's the misfire from the beginning, right? What's the first misfire that I heard, right? Most likely, and I can't confirm this just because there's no way to confirm it now, but most likely it did float the valves, right? That was our initial thought was, you know, 44 pounds of boost, stock VCT, um, relatively light spring pressure to not overcome the VCT. Uh, we thought we floated the valves. Um, so most likely that's what happened, right? Uh, we had, I don't know, 50 or 60 dyno pulls uh, on this particular set of springs and this particular combination. Um, and so the misfire that I heard initially probably was floating the valves or something minor like that. Hey, it could have even, it could have even been a plug. Um, and so once we thought we had a problem, which we maybe had a small problem, but not the big problem it turned into, uh, that's when kind of the can of worms uh, unraveled, right? So we had the misfire, right? Car made 1654, heard a misfire, started checking stuff. Um, and it wasn't long after that, that we thought maybe it was a fuel problem. Um, and so we drained the tank. Uh, and when I drained the tank, we never put fuel back in it. So the issue was more or less fixed once we put gas in the tank, believe it or not. Um, we never really checked, uh, how much power the car is making on uh, the ethanol in the tank because we thought that the fuel might be bad. We put in known good 93 octane and never put in more than about five gallons. And so once we pumped everything out, it left the passenger side completely dry uh, and our issue was you know, more or less self-inflicted. Um, so as dumb as it sounds, make sure you've got gas in your tank, but also make sure you understand how the fuel system works because I thought I did, but I didn't. Uh, and so knowing how the fuel system works and um, how you know the crossover works and all that kind of stuff is important uh, because it would have saved me a handful of weeks of diagnostic and uh, going round and around, swapping engines, swapping sensors. So yeah having a good understanding of your fuel system, how the lines work, uh, how everything is designed to function and work together uh, is critical. Uh, I thought I understood, um, and I understood a little bit, but not enough. Uh, I understood just enough to get myself in trouble, <laughs> but not enough to uh, accurately uh, diagnose an issue that turned out to be more or less self-inflicted. So, um, big lesson learned but it's something that I'm never gonna forget because it's ingrained in my head uh, based on the uh, events of the last few weeks. So anyway, thanks again for watching. Uh, we'll see you at the next one.